of the word because I trust that they have sought to be faithful in presenting it to us. Amen. All right. So uh, we're going to have we're going to start with Brother Chris. Christopher Closser is going to start off for us. Is it Christopher Closser? Is that right? Okay, that's your in, I'm in trouble name. Yes. Yes. And then um, and then um, Nate Nathaniel, Sir Nathaniel is going to uh, be closing it out for us. Uh, so I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. And as as I uh, pray for us, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask Chris to come up and, and get prepared. And uh, then we'll hear from the word. Father, thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, God, for the word of God. And, and Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in your house. Uh, Father, I pray, Lord, for those that are not here. God, I pray that you would um, encourage them and, and, and uh, work in their hearts, Lord, and, and lead us, Father, to be uh, faithful in your house. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, the the work and the time and the studying that uh, our brothers here this evening have put into uh, serving us um, a meal from your word, Lord, uh, would be uh, met with and reciprocated, Lord, uh, with uh, encouragement and, and um, obedience, Father, in what you're teaching us. And Lord, I just ask that you would uh, bring us to nothing, uh, bring them to nothing before you, and, uh, Lord, be glorified in their preaching and in our receiving. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Okay, so I've never... Oh, hey, that already working. I was about to say I've never used one of these. I'm used to just holding a mic. Uh, does that sound good? Too close? Okay. So I wanted to, before I get into it, I want to preface this with saying what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, what I felt led to talk about, uh, is not going to do you any good if you're not already saved, uh, if you're not a born-again Christian. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about works. It's going to be really devotional, really practical. Um, so anything I talk about tonight that isn't clearly, hey, this is how you get saved, don't take it as say I'm, I'm saying we need to do this to be saved. Clearly, the Bible is, is very cut and dry about what salvation entails, and it's not works. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what we talk about tonight, what our works, what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, it's not, not getting you into heaven. There's going to be some passages that talk about avoiding hell. You know, we, we're, we've avoided hell as, as born-again believers. But there's something to learn from that. Uh, Titus, and I don't have this one, Aaron, sorry. This was a late ad. Titus 3, uh, starting in verse 5, says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If you have doubts about that, or you've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, please ask someone after the service. Or if you're watching online, please message me or one of the pastors here or comment on our YouTube, uh, anything like that, uh, because I don't want you to leave here tonight not having that sure. Um, but what I do want to talk about is I think that we as Christians have a lot of work to do to live up to that name. Um, what we can do today is only possible because of his sacrifice, but he has left us with something to do. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there before we start. Just, you know, I don't want any, uh, anything getting crossed over or anything being misunderstood that I don't want you to leave here doubting your salvation or thinking you need to do these works to be saved. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Raise the hands. How many people set New Year's resolutions this year? Do people still do that? Okay. All right, okay. I thought, I guess, I mean, I didn't, so... Yeah, I was, I was expecting nobody. So the fact that, well, I knew Robert would set them. You're very goal-oriented. That's a good thing. It's a good thing, yeah. Um, but, but think about if you were going to set a New Year's resolution, you know, what would it be for, right? There's some common ones, maybe some personal ones. Um, have any of you ever set a resolution to not sin in the next year? Like you just sat down and you said, I'm not going to sin 2023. But why, why haven't you? Why, why don't we? Do we think it's not possible? Um, so what do we do with the verses we've been going over the past couple of weeks in 1 John? 
You know, 1 John 1, verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, 1 John 3, 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So what do we do with those verses? If we're saying, yeah, yeah, but I'm going to sin, I can't make that my resolution. And you can say, now hold on, I've got two natures. I've got a flesh, a sin nature, I've got a God nature in me. And I'll say, congratulations, you were listening last Sunday, because that's what Robert told us. But if we know that, what do we do with that information? Here's some more verses for you. Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Those that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. Can that be said of us tonight? Could the key to ceasing sin be maybe in some circumstances when our flesh should be suffering or denied? Uh, later we'll talk about an important word, mortified. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you go to 2 Peter 1 and look in the previous verses, he talks about those that have returned to their old sins and that they're blind. But God promises us that if we keep certain things sure, we won't fall to those old sins. So it is possible to live that sinless life. 1 Corinthians 15, you know, that's where we go to find our gospel. Well, a little bit later, verse 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Some people don't have that knowledge. We should have it. And if we don't ex display it, that's shameful. I think I can definitively say that God doesn't want us to sin. Like, obviously, that's obvious, right? Like, God doesn't want you to sin. He didn't save you so you could return to your vomit. But after we've accepted his gracious payment for that sin, what do we do then? Is it just, all right, we're saved, and now we're not going to sin? Or is there some middle steps? Jesus said it like this to the woman caught in adultery. Uh, in John 8, when Jesus had lifted himself up, or lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine those accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And I know we know the story. All the people that accused her, he, and he said, Those without sin cast the first stone. But look what he said to her. He didn't say, I'm not going to stone you either. He said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And before you get on me about, again, this is Old Testament, Jesus hadn't died yet, didn't we have adultery with the world before we were saved? Weren't we in that same position? Ephesians 2, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know, we love to quote John 3.16, but the next two verses say that we were condemned already before we met that glorious purpose with Jesus, before we were saved. So Jesus could have been talking to you or me instead of that woman, and his words would be the same. The part of you that matters now, the part that he has changed, your soul, that's no longer condemned. So what's our command now? Our command is to go and sin no more. So why do we keep sinning? You know, that, that's the question. Why do we keep sinning then? Yes, one reason is our flesh. Romans 7 talks about that a lot. Paul talks about why we keep sinning. And I'm sorry, that was a, it's a big passage, so a lot of reading there. But I'll read it for you, so you don't worry. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which is I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now then it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. 
For the will is present with me, but how to reform that which is good, I find not. We're not going to find how to do it in our flesh. We're just not. If we live in our flesh, we're going to sin. But again, that's why we have those two natures now. That's why it is possible. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So, we know it. I mean, everyone here pretty much knows. It's the flesh. You fall to the flesh, you're going to sin. Your, your flesh wants to sin. That's just its, its natural way of going about things. But I think a compounding reason, so it's easy to just say, well, we have the flesh. That's why we're going to sin. But I think a compounding reason is our unwillingness to do anything about our flesh. The, the Bible repeatedly calls us to action against our flesh. Colossians 3, starting in verse 5, says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify. It's a verb. It means to put to death, to bury. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil... Ah, cons- oh, Chris got me. What? Cons- bleh, now, if I hadn't been up here, I could say that word, I promise. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now the Bible calls us to put them off. Get rid of them. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lies. We've put off that old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. We have another option now. But how do we use that option? Ephesians 5, starting in verse 1, says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh saints. Not once named among you. Not, eh, when you fall to the flesh, it's okay. It can be not once named. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So I think I'm, I've made the point enough. God doesn't want you to sin. You shouldn't have to sin. You have another option. But how do we do that? How do we get there? Practically, how do we get there? So my uh, metaphor I'm using is New Year's resolutions, right? Think about those. What if I told you that, uh, now I don't smoke, but if I did and I wanted to quit smoking this year, you know, so I said, my New Year's resolution is I'm not going to smoke anymore. And then later you come over to my house and there's just a carton of cigarettes on my, on my kitchen counter. And there's like a pack in my pocket. You can see it bulging in my pocket. And then like you, I give you a ride later, and in the bottom of my car, there's a couple loose cigarettes down there. Like, do you think I'm really trying? Like, am I trying to quit smoking? Like, I didn't even get the patch, okay? Like, I'm not trying. But how often do we do that spiritually? How often do we pray for God to get us to stop smoking with a lit cigarette, like, still in our mouth? I mean, don't we do that with God sometimes? Why do we expect him to help us when we won't even get rid of the sin that's in our own camp? And that's my transition into my next biblical example, which we all know, the story of Achan. And I know we use it sometimes to explain why a certain ministry might not be working or why a church is hurting because of sin in the camp. But don't you think God's going to apply to that, that to us individually as well, not just as a ministry? Um, if you want to open to Joshua 7, you can, because that's, that's, that's too much words to put on the screen. And I just highlighted a few things in Joshua 7 um, about sin in the camp. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, so bear with me, and uh, make a few comments, and then we'll tie it back into New Year's resolutions. But... The children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake to them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. 
And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all of the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So they went up thither the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote about them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherever the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So the first thing I notice there is, it start, the chapter starts out saying that Achan did something bad. He did something forbidden. He took a, an accursed thing. And because of it now, the ministry was damaged. The mission was damaged. The people lost the battle. It should have been an easy fight. Not many people. The Israelites are like, eh, we'll send a couple people. And they got killed. They should have won. And they didn't. Well, why didn't they? Well, because there's sin in the camp. Joshua rent his clothes, verse 6, and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, even until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And you can feel the, the, how upset Joshua is and the shame he's feeling because not only is it embarrassing to lose the battle, he's got to explain why he lost men to the, those men's families. He's got to exp- explain why when God was helping them so much, now all of a sudden God's not helping them. So they have to get to the bottom of it, right? Because God answers Joshua and tells him why he's not with him. In verse 11, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they even have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Taking that accursed thing and hiding it and putting it where no one could have it. I mean, later in the chapter, you'll find out he buried it under his tent. You know, he thought he got away with it, but, but God knows. And even worse, it, it pushed God away from them in that moment. He wasn't helping them. He wasn't protecting them or leading them or helping them to get done what they needed to get done. And it required drastic action. It required, first, a confession. Joshua got all the people together. He went among them. They walked in front of him. And the Lord led him to figure out who it was. And in uh, verse 24, it says, And Joshua and all Israel with him. Oh, wait, hold on. Verse 20, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, that I covered them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. It, They had to get to the bottom of it. They had to find out what the sin was. And then it needed to be dealt with. Um, In these days, that kind of thing led to stoning and then burning. They not only stoned it, they then burned it all. But now think about in our day, in our church age, in our personal ministries. Is there any sin in our camps that we think we've got buried, that we are not really dealing with right now, that's stopping us from doing the mission God has given us. Whatever that sin is, get it out. Take ownership of it, whether it be personal or public, if that's what it takes, and get rid of it. Confess it. You can draw strength from fellow believers. There there are other people that might be struggling with it, or even to the fact that sharing with someone, you're not alone in it, but let's get rid of it. Restore fellowship with God. Um. And maybe a, a little closer to home metaphor for you it would be a different resolution. Um, maybe I can explain it better this way. Say, say I've quit drinking and I've quit smoking. I'm really trying to be healthy now. So now I'm trying to lose weight, right? That's my, that's my, last year I quit smoking. This year I'm losing weight. If I said I resolved to lose weight, does it just magically happen? You know, ask Chris. He's the nutritionist back there. He knows. Weight, weight loss isn't just in the gym either. It's in the kitchen. To resolve to lose weight, I need to resolve to drink more water, get more sleep, change my diet, exercise more, possibly target sources of stress in my life and anxiety which can lead to weight gain. I may need to change my entire life around to really achieve my goals. 
But we won't do that spiritually. We'll do that for physical things. Although, and this is kind of silly, but there is a quicker way to lose weight. You could just chop your arm off, right? Like if I chop my arm off, how much weight do you think I could lose? 15 pounds? Maybe? How about, how about an eye? If I gouged out an eye, how much weight could I lose real quick? Is there any spiritual arms or eyes you need to get rid of? Matthew 5, verse 27 says, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and that not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And this is why I said that what I did at the beginning is obviously I'm not going to tell you that you need to stop sinning so you don't go to hell. There's only one person that can decide if you are or not going to hell. So I hope you've had that conversation with him already. But spiritualize it, devotionalize it here. If, what, if, is there something that's stopping you from serving God? Is it better for you to hold on to that thing or is it better for you to get rid of it and keep serving. How many times have you heard someone say, or have you said yourself, I just can't beat this temptation. I just can't beat this sin, or I'm really having to fight. I keep having to fight this sin. Is there a sin that you keep coming back to? Maybe you haven't even consciously thought about it like that. But here's another question. Is there a sin that you've, multi- you've prayed multiple times for, that you've asked God to take from you multiple times? And maybe that's what he needs you to go through. Maybe it's one of those things. But also you need to think about, is there an anchor attached to that sin? Is there some part of that sin or some anchor in your life that's causing you to be in a situation where you keep being susceptible to it? For example, you're trying to quit drinking. Do you still have alcohol in the house? Do you live with someone who drinks? Do you go out with friends to bars thinking you'll just have a Coke? You know, do you have a really expensive bottle that someone gave you, and you don't want to throw it out because it was really expensive, and if they come over, they're going to want to have it, and they're going to, I don't want to, you know. Are you still saved? Yeah, but you're sabotaging yourself. Another example could be lust. If you're struggling with porn, why don't you have an accountability partner? Why don't you have an internet blocker? You know, why do you go on the internet? Um, Marital issues. Have you humbled yourself and asked one of our pastors for counseling? You know, there are steps we can take to to help ourselves conquer these things. But we don't. And I don't know if it's pride or laziness or fear. But the, there are steps available. And again, you're still saved. You're just sabotaging yourself. How about your speech? The Bible says to let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Ephesians 4.29. I think I just quoted it there in my notes. But <laughs> um, You want to clean up your mouth, but what are you letting in your ears? You know, what are you surrounding yourself with? And I get, like, at the workplace, that was always hard for me because people at work have filthy mouths. But have you said anything? Have you asked them to help you? You know, not in an arrogant way, but in a humble way. Have you asked for accountability in that? And I get that these examples are simple, you know, like uh, mouths and uh, stuff. But there's some that are hard to hear. And these are the ones where it really might feel like you're losing an arm relationships and people are there people in your life that make you so mad that you feel you have no choice but to fly off the handle and sin or temptation someone you just can't seem to get it right with is the relationship worth risking your fellowship with god is it worth doing the the struggling and the falling and then then getting it right for a while and then suffering shame again or is it better to endure the pain of cutting it off? And I can't make that choice for anyone here. I can barely make that choice for myself. And it doesn't affect our salvation, but it does affect our current standing in this work and in this world. Romans 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So I get it's a bit juvenile to compare cutting off people that we have relationships with to like, you know, not throwing out the chocolate that's in our pantry because we're on a diet. But someone who refuses to make a lifestyle change will not lose weight. And someone who refuses to make a lifestyle change will not gain crowns in eternity. 
A few years ago, I could have gouged out an eye and saved years of hurt and worked to get back into this ministry. What in your life are you holding on to that way? You want more people at church? Well, so do I. But what are we willing to do to get them here? You know, I'm doing this little speaking thing right now. I could have gotten people to come. I told three people that I was going to be speaking tonight. And one of them I told like 30 minutes ago. Like, that's not setting myself up for success. Um, and maybe, you know, I don't want them to come to hear me, but I do want them to come to hear, and I want them to be here. So am I willing to leverage that relationship to get them? Are we willing to leverage, leverage our jobs or our families to do the right thing, or even forget the right thing just to get people to church? Um, I don't know why I didn't invite more people. You know, it's, it's a shame on me. I should have pushed. And if we've come to a point where we don't want to push someone anymore because we're worried about that relationship or ostracizing them or they might get mad at me and they, they got mad at me last time, then are you willing to knock the dust off your feet and move on? Because if you're not, then keep pushing. Because if you're too scared to push for fear of losing, but you won't move on from that person, then you're just in the middle ground. And we know what God thinks about the middle ground. He doesn't want you to be hot or cold. Or he wants you to be hot or cold, not in the middle. But enough. that's my heavy part. I'll leave you with a little bit of encouragement because um, the actions we might have to take could be drastic, but our Savior did us one better. He not only came and died for our sins, he set the example for our lives while doing so. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you think Jesus felt pain and suffering when he was tempted like we are? Do you think he felt the same feelings we do? I think he did. I believe he did. Luke 4. You know, that's the, exa the example we go to when, well, when was Jesus tempted? Luke 4. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did, not, he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Do you think Jesus' stomach hurt and his body ached after forty days of being hungry and thirsty and tired? Do you think, you know, how often do we get in a circumstance where we want to talk to someone and our stomach hurts? You know, it's like, oh, my tummy hurt. You know, it's the same thing, whether it's physical or mental. Jesus kept going and he centered the, he centered the temptation off the word of God and his spiritual needs over his physical needs. Continuing in verse 5, it says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Isn't acceptance something we all want? Don't we all want to be the leader? Don't we all want people to look up to us, to follow us, to say, that guy knows what he's doing, or that girl is the best at this, and we need to learn from her, or follow them? Don't you think Jesus felt that too? In his, he was 100% man. Don't you think his flesh had the same needs we do, to feel accepted, to feel validated? But is that what he did? No. He said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And I know he is God, but hear me there. Peer pressure is an extremely hard thing to fight, but why don't we use it with each other to encourage and uplift? Why is it always peer pressure and not peer uplifting? And then to finish off Luke 4, in verse 9, it says, He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The most basic physical needs of our flesh is to feel safe. 
Many people stay in situations because they're too worried about failing or falling or, or leaving the safe zone. But where would we be safer than living in God's will? Jesus went through all this to prove that through God's power, a sinless life is possible. But it took obedience to God's will to do so. Philippians 2, famous passage, starting verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was able to live a sinless life because he humbled himself and obeyed God. He did what was right always. And that is the, the mystery of godliness, the fact that God could do no sin, but yet his human body could, yet he did not. And that's why he was the perfect sacrifice for us. But we can do it too. And Becky told me not to put this in, but I'm going to say it. After all, as Tebow kept reminding us when he played football, we can do all things through Christ. It's really that simple. The hard part is doing it. The hard part is the middle steps. We all know we're supposed to not sin. We all know we're supposed to get people to church. We're supposed to tell the gospel. But what are those middle steps that we're not doing to get to the end goal? I challenge you to examine your life, remove any sin in your camp, make a plan for any changes you may need to make in your life, and take hope that in Jesus that he will allow you to do so. And then encourage others that are trying to do the same.